year was 1887, and the scene was a small neighborhood grocery store. Emmanuel Nanger, N-E-N-G-E-R, is buying some turnip greens. And he gives the clerk a check, I'm sorry, he gives the clerk a $20 bill. And the clerk begins to put the money into the cash drawer to give Mr. Nanger his change. And she notices some of the ink is coming off of the $20 bill on her fingers, which were damp from the turnip greens. She looks at Mr. Nanger, a man who she has known for years, who's been a customer of the store for years. And she looks at the smudged $20 bill. He's a trusted friend, and she's known him all her life. He can't be a counterfeiter, she thought. She gives him his change, and he leaves the store. But $20 is a lot of money in 1887. I mean, think about it. And she eventually calls the police. They verify that the bill was counterfeit, and they get a search warrant, warrant to look through Mr. Ninger's apartment. In the attic above his apartment, they find where he is reproducing money. He is a master artist, and he is actually hand painting with brushes and paint each one of those $20 bills. But also in the attic, they find three portraits that Ninger had painted. They seized these portraits and eventually sold them at auction for $16,000. In 1887 currency, remember. Or a little bit more than $5,000 each. The irony is that it took Mr. Ninger almost as long to paint that $20 bill as it did each one of those paintings. It's true that um, Emanuel Ninger was a thief, but the person from whom he s actually stole was himself. So many husbands and wives are doing the very same thing today in their marriages. They're stealing their own treasures by either their actions or in some cases their lack of action, their non-actions. Have you ever sat down and made a list of the treasures of your marriage? May I suggest if you haven't that you do? Try it sometime. And by the way, do you know who... Do you, do you really want to know who the best treasure list maker, who the best treasure list makers are? They are those who have been married at one time, but aren't anymore. From leading a divorce recovery program on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, primarily in this area for over 15 years, I've met many men and women who re never really re realized what a treasure their marriage was until it was stolen from them by a divorce. It was actually stolen in one of three ways. Number one, treasures can be stolen by our comparisons. Our endless evaluating and even wishing that things might be different. In other words, evaluating by comparing. Um, how do we do that? First of all, by comparing your spouse to other guys' spouses. Uh, you might say at work, you know, your wife gets up and makes breakfast every morning for you. I sure wish mine would. That's how it all begins, things like that. Or she might say, your husband built that table for you? It's beautiful. 
Mine won't even hang a picture, and he can't, don't really know how to hang a picture. Now, what's the danger here when they do that? Resentment can build. Uh, and you're actually stealing treasures from your own marriage. Secondly, you can get into a situation where you're comparing your, your financial situations to that or of other couples. And this is potentially dangerous for a lot of reasons. First of all, someone in that marriage is going to feel cheated. They're going to feel cheated and dissatisfied because their family is not doing as well as the one next door or down the street or across town. <clears throat> Number two, treasures of a marriage are also stolen by a lack of appreciation for each other. Both men and women often discuss the various problems in their, in their marriages, but that's as, as far as it goes. Instead of digging deep and finding out what the real root of the problems are, they begin to clam up or run, up, uh, run out of ideas and just give up. They often focus on those things that uh, they want done that's not being done by that other partner rather than on focusing on all that is done and being done well. You know, everybody, practically everybody in marriage gets something right every now and then. Um, now here's an assignment for you. Tomorrow, take just a few minutes and think of the most recent thing that your spouse did that you really appreciate. If you can only think of one, well that's one and write it down. And then do it again the following day. Um, day after day, at least for a week, preferably for a month. Do it until you realize that, that you have an awful lot of things to appreciate about your spouse. So, the cure to all of this is acceptance. Accepting her for who she is. Accepting him, ladies, for who he is. And his, his good qualities. Number three. Married, marital treasures are also often stolen by time. What am I talking about? You might remember that old Bruce Springsteen song from another generation. Glory Days. He sings about the guy who can't quit thinking about all the fun that he had back in high school. He says, time slips away and leaves you with nothing but boring stories of glory days. Many couples had their glory days in the first years of the mar their marriages. But because they were preoccupied, I guess you could say, with other things, things other than marital maintenance, doing the things necessary to maintain their marriage. Now all they have left are those memories of their former glory days. Um, there are a lot of things that consume us in our or consume our, the time in our life. If you were to keep a daily log it would probably surprise you how you spend your time. You'd find that uh, you were spending an awful lot of time on things that mean absolutely nothing. That you could be spending time maintaining your marriage or enhancing your marriage. Giving something to your marriage. I never will forget one time I took my daughter out to dinner one night, just the two of us, before she was married, I think. And uh, we, we still do that now, by the way, from time to time. But this night, we went over to Biloxi, and we went in this restaurant, had a good dinner, 
little conversation, but you know how it is in a lot of restaurants. It's real loud. And it's just, you know, there's a lot of people watching going on there by us. We're looking around as we eat. We got ready to leave. Paid our, I paid our check and we walked outside. And the minute that I walked outside, I looked up to my right toward the Gulf of Mexico. And there was the biggest, most beautiful yellow moon you ever saw in your life. I said, sweetheart, you want to go for a walk on the beach? And she said, sure, Dad. So we got in the car and we went, pulled over and got in the other lane, came back um, toward the east and pulled off in one of those bays on Highway 90. And we walked down to the beach. And you could hear the sound of the waves and still look out there and you could see that great big old moon over the gulf and we started walking and we walked and we talked and we walked some more and we talked some more and finally I said you about ready to go back she said sure now I don't know how long we were out there but I do know that it took us about maybe 15 or 20 minutes to even get back close to where the car was so we had walked a long way. Later, next day or so, it occurred to me that my memories, if I'm sitting and talking with her and telling her about my memories of my prior life, she may be interested a little bit, but they don't mean a whole lot to her. If she's sitting and talking to me about her memories, like of her childhood, of course I'm going to get a kick out of that because I'm her dad, but her memories are not going to mean to me what they mean to her. But listen guys, the memories that she and I have created together are vitally important to both of us. You see, we have that common bond now. Right now, I haven't tried this, but if I mention that night to her, she said, Oh yeah, Dad, I remember that. I remember that. That was special. <coughs> My question to you, have you been creating those kind of memories with your wife? With your fiancé? <coughs> Significant other? Have you been working on those kinds of things? You see, those kinds of moments... They don't typically happen around a television set after work. Even after she's finished with the kitchen, the cooking, and the kids, and all that, and comes and sits by you. Everybody's exhausted. These kinds of moments happen because somebody took the initiative to make these things happen. Time, if we're not careful, Time is going to be slipping away and leaving us with absolutely nothing but boring stories of our glory days and our marriages. The enemy of our faith, men, is a thief and a liar. And I think we all know who that is. That's Satan. And one of the things many often allowed to be stolen from our marriages is, is, is seeing our spouse as a gift from God, which she is. If God is God, and He is, and if He's in control of our lives, which He attempts to be at least, and if He can orchestrate all the events in our lives to bring about certain things, and He does quite often, why wouldn't this marriage be His gift from, us, from Him to us? And we need to treat it as such. We fail to see Him or her, our spouse, as they are a gift autographed by God. To not only bless our lives, but also to hone down, to smooth down our rough edges, 
Think about the edges you might have that would be sticking up that would rub other people the wrong way if it were not for her reminding it you, you that you have those. Ladies, think about those rough edges that you might have if you didn't have him to remind you of those rough edges. Um, scripture says in Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Or a spouse sharpens a spouse, right? We sometimes allow ourselves to become so focused on the negative that we don't see the positive and acknowledge that. We don't acknowledge the positive. We all need to realize that as we encourage each other to spur one another on to love and good deeds, that we should be thankful when that actually happens and becomes a reality. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Seldom do hurtful, hateful words benefit anyone. Have you ever been around an older couple who spoke to each other with respect, kindness, and adoration for each other? What a rare but a beautiful thing that is when we see that. Think about the things that you've said to your spouse recently over the last week, month, even year if you can remember that. Was your talk wholesome? And did it benefit her? Or did it benefit him? And those around you that were listening? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be truthful and confrontational. <coughs> but when you were, was it spoken in love? Where your motivation was to help your spouse and enhance your marital partnership. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, if someone is caught in a sin, in other words, or your spouse makes a mistake, maybe you've got a spouse that never makes a mistake. Most people don't. In fact, I don't know of anyone who does. <laughs> He says, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him or her gently. But watch yourself, he says, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this you will fulfill the law of Christ. I really like that last part of that verse carry each other's burdens. And in this you will fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is one that commands that we love each other. Did you ever think about that? That that's not a suggestion from God? It's a command that we're to love our spouse. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church and gave Himself for it. And what's implied there is the spouse would do, the wife would do the same toward her husband. Those who fulfill that law carry each other's burdens. If you're loving your spouse like Paul says in Ephesians 5.25, then you are fulfilling that law. And you are carrying her burdens for her. And ladies, you are carrying his burdens for him if you're fulfilling that. This law of Christ doesn't allow us to reproach an offender or to taunt an offender or to rejoice in his or her mistakes or misfortunes. We should help him or her to take 
up their load, in other words, their burden, and sustain him or her um, by our counsels, by our exhortations, and by our prayers. They should be embraced with kindness, understanding, and love. Now, let's look back at these three ways that treasures are stolen from a marriage and explore the benefits of not allowing the theft to ever occur in the first place. First, treasures are stolen by comparisons. What are we talking about here? When we don't do that, it prevents resentment from building. Uh, contentment in relationships begin to grow. And you're going to be drawn closer to one another and you won't feel cheated. Now, let's look at treasures stolen by lack of appreciation. There, you're affirming rather than tearing down your mate. That appreciation becomes a reward and encourages more good behavior. Cultivating a new lifestyle of appreciation that actually endears you to your spouse. And finally, treasure stolen by time. Your spouse could possibly, if you spent more time, invested more time with her, him or her, your spouse could possibly become your real best friend. Wouldn't that be awesome? By spending more quality time together, you may begin to realize that you are married to a great person. This is an incredible human being that you landed here. It's all a matter of perspective and attitude. Marriages are in many ways like building a, a good business partnership. When the partners are both doing their jobs, the business does well. When one or both aren't, the business begins to suffer. And sometimes the family will go bankrupt. We see a lot of that now, don't we? You know, sometimes the hardest words for some to ever speak are these. You know, honey, I've been wrong. And I'm sorry. Help me be the spouse that you deserve. But when that happens, precious treasures of the marriage are being preserved. Can you see that, guys? Ladies, can you see that precious treasures of a marriage are being preserved when you maintain that positive attitude in the marriage rather than always the negative? And the couple can always look forward to accumulating more and more treasures in their future together. Marriage is probably the most complicated relationship you'll ever be involved in. But at the same time, it's still not rocket science. Our society has provided so much help. Our problem is we won't ask for it. We won't receive it. At the first sign of trouble, fall on your knees. Fall on your face before God and begin to pray. Do everything you can within your power to encourage your spouse to fall there beside you and pray with you. I've never been in the privacy of a couple's home like that when this was happening. But I can't rem imagine that an argument would take place while you're on your knees praying before God. I can't imagine that you would get up off your knees and start to argue again after that. It would solve an awful lot of problems. I hope tonight, as we talked about these things, it's been a time of reflection in your own relationship with your spouse. 
It's been a time when you, you can actually contemplate what your future holds with him or with her. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for who you are and all you do. We ask you to bless these men and ladies in such a way that uh, their marriages will bloom, begin to grow, and be an example to many, many other couples of what marriage can be when we put you at the very center of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much.